And so, yes, we're here today to talk about creating a multi-stakeholder approach to building a sustainable culture of academic integrity. So I'll tell you all about what that's about throughout the session. Uh, my research background also focuses on academic integrity. So today's session will be evidence-based, uh, but also grounded in practice and, and reality of, uh, you know, this is not a theoretical area, research. it's a very hands-on area, and it's a rapidly changing field as well. As is customary in Canada, now I begin with a territorial acknowledgement um, in, in recognizing the Indigenous territory in which um, I, as someone of a settler background, um, of, as a someone with a with a British background, um, both my parents have um, have British background and came to this country as settlers. So I acknowledge the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 people on which this land is situated in southern Alberta, including the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bakani, and Gainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. And my city, the city of Calgary, where I live, near Banff and the Rocky Mountains, is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. In Canada now, we often begin our presentations and events with a territorial acknowledgement to recognize not only the land, but the people who have come to create the country that we live in today, both Indigenous and those of us of settler backgrounds. So speaking of gratitude, I know that your chat is turned off, um, but I, I would like to, uh, as you're making notes and questions for today, when the chat is turned on, I would invite you to extend your gratitude to the organizers of today. Uh, and when Mr. Kelly said that the network formed about six months prior to COVID hitting, I expect that they had no idea what was about to, uh, to come before them as they began their work. And I can only imagine how extraordinarily busy they've been in many unanticipated ways. So please join me in showing appreciation for all of the organizers of today's event. Please jot down a little note to add in the chat later on, because I know that a whole lot of effort went into organizing today's event. And I mentioned that um, I, am a, I am a researcher, I'm a professor in a school of education, I'm a qualitative researcher, and as such I've been trained to start by a research presentation or, or any kind of lecture by declaring my positionality, and that includes for me um, it's sort of telling you a little bit about who I am and how I come to this work and what are my biases and that sort of thing. So I've been teaching in higher education since 1994. Um, much of it at the University of Calgary. I was what's called here a sessional or contract part-time academic staff member for more than 20 years before securing a tenure track position. I'm a tenured professor now and it took a long time to get there. But during the first couple of decades of my career, um, I took teaching jobs wherever I could get them because that's what happens when you're, you're part of the gig academy, as Adriana Kazar would say. Um, and uh, as a result of that, I, I began, uh, I taught my first online course in 2005, if you can believe it, it was through a system called Blackboard Collaborate. Um, and since then became interested in online learning, uh, although I didn't really start to um, teach many of my courses online until 2011 when I shifted pretty much my entire career online because that's where the teaching opportunities were being presented at that time at our university, as I expect in others, we had sort of um, groupings of professors, if you will, some of whom liked teaching only face-to-face -face and insisted on having their classes only face-to-face, -face, and others who liked uh, teaching online. And this created almost a, a division. Um, and ultimately a technical uh, and technology related division as well, because those of us who were comfortable online developed some facility around that. Um, as a result of that, I've taught now more than 100 courses online at the uh, postgraduate level and uh, as well as continuing in professional development. And in the School of Education where I work, we have a large um, graduate education that involves blended and online learning with more than 900 students enrolled per year. So most of my graduate supervision has been online and some of my students um, I've never met uh, in person, though we do meet virtually synchronously via Zoom quite regularly. Uh, and when I, if I do get to meet them at the graduation ceremonies, if they come for that in person, it's quite a wonderful experience to meet them. Um, and otherwise we stay connected. Uh, and that idea of developing relationships and getting to know people at a distance is something that we became accustomed to uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and so when COVID hit, there, some things weren't new, some things 
were, were being revised. But for those who have experience working online, we've known about some of the threats that have been posed to our students and how to overcome them. Um, and as I mentioned, I research academic integrity and ethics in higher education, which of course comes with um, a side focus on looking at corruption in higher education, uh, and in particular, the ways in which contract cheating is corrupting um, our educational systems. And just so that you know, uh, because I work in academic integrity, uh, so as not to be called out for self-plagiarism, I have presented some of today's content uh, in other presentations and specifically at the European Network for Academic Integrity Conference earlier this year. Um, so that's a little bit about me and how I came to this work and how I came to be here with you today. Delighted to be here with you. Um, but let's kind of go back to something that Mr. Kelly was talking about a little bit earlier when he was uh, giving his opening remarks setting the foundations or our view around academic integrity as a shared responsibility. For a long time, for decades actually, or maybe even centuries, academic integrity was seen only as uh, an issue of student conduct or a matter of student judicial affairs. Um, and over, over recent decades, advocates, scholars and educators across multiple countries have been calling for a shift in how we look at this calling instead for a multi-stakeholder approach where we put students at the center of our work, but that letting them know that we're not alone and also uh, accepting that we as other members of the community, the learning community, have uh, some responsibility to play. And this includes responsibility for staff, um, and where I'll situate myself here by saying in Canada, staff will mean those without academic appointments. And we call those with academic appointments faculty, uh, faculty members, um, though I understand that the terminology can, can change from one country to another. So whether you're working as academic staff or um, support staff or administrative staff, management staff, these all of us play a role in this way, as well as the administration at the senior level, uh, certainly in terms of setting the institutional tone for academic integrity. Um, and situating it as a shared responsibility for our students. And I've also included community stakeholders here. Uh, and I'm guessing that you might be in the same situation as we are in, in Canada and North America broadly, and that parents are taking an increased role uh, in their students' education right through to the postgraduate levels. And um, uh, a prominent researcher in this field, Dr. Donald McCabe, who's uh, passed several years ago, talked about how a parents' interest in academic integrity is often um, only triggered when their students or when their children um, are facing an allegation of academic misconduct. And then parents become interested and sometimes become interested in putting pressure on uh, an, an educational administrator for a particular outcome of, say, an investigation. Um, and so many of us are advocating for uh, engaging parents and other stakeholders, school alumni and others in different ways, more proactive ways and positive ways so that our first interactions with them are one where we're talking about building cultures of integrity rather than having to look at it as, um, you know, oh, we don't need to get the lawyers involved and we don't want the parents upset, etc. Uh, and, and for us also including community stakeholders as including K-12 teachers. Um, and, and pol politicians that work in the kindergarten through, uh, for us, would be grade 12 levels. And understanding that academic integrity starts long before our students come to our higher education institutions, that K-12 remains one of the most neglected um, sectors of education. And so often our students will come to our campuses and they have very little training in how to uphold and enact academic integrity in the post-secondary environment. Uh, and we hear time and time again that our students don't get any training, for example, in plagiarism prevention, citing, referencing, and yet the minute they land on our university campuses, be it virtually or in person, we expect them to know how to do these things. And they come to us, whether it's from another country or from a school down the street, having in some cases, no idea what the skills are that are expected that they would implement to uphold academic integrity. So there's a big disconnect for those of us who do this work to do it not only in higher education, but to reach further into the community to engage parents, teach or teachers and other members of our community um, to start this work early and talk about it often, both in school and outside. So this wraparound approach in various ways has been reiterated by researchers in Australia, Tracy Bertag in the UK, um, Erica Morris 
in the United States, Trisha Bertram Gallant and others. So this kind of advocacy and framing of this is happening not only uh, in one country, but in multiple countries across multiple continents. And we really are trying to get away from the idea that it is solely a student responsibility. Because when, when we focus only on student act behavior, um, or in uh, as they do in the United States, uh, on, on character education or moral development, it really can create a situation in which there uh, can be antagonistic relationships with our students. And once that happens, the trust is broken and students no longer feel like they're supported in their learning environment. So one of the objectives of a multi-stakeholder approach is to reduce antagonistic and adversarial relationships with our students in which students are demonized uh, for not knowing what they what they should know uh, and we think and us thinking that we can abdicate uh, our responsibilities of teaching them. I will often tell my colleagues it is not enough to have a statement in our course outlines pointing students to the institutional policies of academic integrity and consider our work done and dusted. That academic integrity is an ongoing practice and it's the foundation for ethical conduct in life. So it's not just about upholding academic integrity in school, but rather preparing students for an ethical future, whether that's in the trades, whether it's in a future in industry, in nonprofit, government, or in education themselves. Everything we do in school sets them up for their future. And so teaching them these broad principles of academic integrity can and will have implications beyond graduation in whatever program of study they choose. So this is sort of the, the framing of this as we go along. Um, and because, you know, Mr. Kelly talked about how uh, things have changed during COVID, right? And so much of what we do, th well, things will never go back to what we've done before. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at the difference between emergency remote teaching versus online teaching. So the world that I came from of online learning and teaching was very, very different from what we ex have experienced during COVID as emergency remote learning. So for example, we know that online learning pre-COVID, often students chose it because they wanted it um, or it was a convenient option. But there is an element of voluntary um, uh, participation in online learning. And we also know that people who taught in online environments prior to COVID-19, we had training and we had experience. We took professional development and professional learning and how to be effective online teachers. Um, and this is something that if you were teaching during the COVID-19 pandemic as pivoting to online remote learning, you didn't get that. Um, and uh, it was very different experience we had the necessary technology to do the work. So we were set up with webcams and earphones and internet connections. Many of us from home, if we were contract uh, teachers or sessional instructors, as we call them here, uh, we had the necessary technology, even just an office chair, something as simple as that to be able to do this work effectively. And we also had time to prepare. Um, and that was part of our course preparation. And, and it was we never had enough, trust me, uh, but nevertheless, that we had time built in because we knew that teaching an online course took as much time, if not more, um, and then preparing a face-to-face -face class. And somewhere along the way, and I can't remember where I learned it, so I can't cite the source, but that um, teaching an online course would take eight hours of preparation for every one hour of class time. And I found that to be about true, though having connected with people in Twitter chats, they're like, oh, I heard it was 10 hours, 10 to 1. Nevertheless, what I'm saying is, you know, when I did my my face to face classes years ago, once I taught the class a few times, I could refresh a little bit, but I could literally pick up my textbooks, walk into my lecture hall and deliver my class uh, without too much preparation. But when you're in an online environment, that doesn't fly. It's new every time. It's fresh every time. It's updated. And the amount of prep work takes a lot longer. Um, and we also had a consistent and stable work environment. We didn't have messaging such as, oh, well, you know, we might be back to campus next month. We knew that for the entire term and probably the entire year, we were working online. If you were teaching online for the first time during COVID-19, that probably wasn't your experience at all. Um, you, you and your, your students may have been simply told that this is what we will be doing. There was no um, voluntary aspect to it whatsoever. It was immediately mandated, the rapid pivot. You may not have had any training or experience or others in your organization. Your IT department may have been completely overwhelmed with requests for help resulting in delays. 
Um, and then you, you may have had inadequate technology to teach effectively online anything from not having a proper webcam or your students uh, not having proper microphones, etc. And we had no time to prepare during COVID. Even, even those of us who were experienced online teachers, uh, we found ourselves with less time to prepare because we were living in the middle of a global pandemic and, and everything was a panic all the time. Uh, and the rapid changes and constant pivots about uh, things moving quickly and uh, getting one's hopes up about what might be happening next week or next month. And here we are moving into now, you know, a year and a half um, and we expect that the situation will continue to remain fluid, as the politicians like to say, and we can't predict the future. But I think Mr. Kelly is absolutely right when he says that online learning is here to stay in some form or another. Um, and so I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time looking at this community of in inquiry framework. It was developed by uh, colleagues here in Canada, Randy Garrison and uh, his team. Uh, and they put this together. It's, now, I will say this framework is not without um, some debate around it, um, but I wanted to present it to you and kind of unpack it a little bit so that we get an idea of how this works for, for online learning. Garrison and colleagues talked about how there are sort of three main presences. This was for in online learning to engage students in an effective learning experience. One would be a social presence, a cognitive presence, and then a teaching presence that provides a foundation. So even the positioning of these overlapping circles here is important because the teaching presence is seen as uh, a foundation to engage students socially, giving them opportunities to connect with one another and with you as the teacher, and also the cognitive presence. So ensuring that they are cognitively challenged and uh, finding that balance between being challenged with their learning but not being overwhelmed with their learning that we're meeting that sweet spot of it's interesting it's challenging it's new it's fun i've got my teeth into new things and yet i'm still being able to scaffold the learning and one of the ways that can be done of course is through uh, selecting content that's appropriate often in online courses we may find that we are um, choosing less content uh, and more opportunities for say supporting discourse and engaging students in conversation to give them time to process what they're learning. And I understand that there have been debates across education, higher education during COVID-19, with people lamenting that they can't cover the same amount of content. And for those of us who've been teaching online for a long time, um, I can assure you that this in no, mean, no way means a dilution uh, of the quality uh, because you're still supporting student learning. And it may mean that the content gets spread out over more courses. But if the students are absorbing it and learning it, then that's, of course, what they're here to do. And as out online educators, it is up to us to set the climate with our students. And so this is where this is the one part of it where I see academic integrity playing a big part of it. When I talk to my students at the beginning of the semester, I say to them, one, um, you know, if you're feeling a time crunch because learning time management skills is something they continue to do as young adults and particularly if they're mature students coming back, they might need to learn those skills. I say, if you find yourself in a time crunch and on the verge of making a bad decision, don't do it. Contact me instead and we'll figure it out together. Um, and I will tell you, I used to be the most militant person in the early years of my career with regards to deadlines. I was of the opinion that deadlines were part of being a grown up and learning how to meet them was an essential aspect of, of schooling. And as I've gone along, and particularly as I've learned more about contract cheating, um, I've softened on that a little bit. And one of the reasons I've softened is because I know that the world for our students today is a very different one than I knew um, going to school and university in the 80s and 90s because although contract cheating has been around for decades it didn't start to scale up until the age of the internet right and we know that for example essay mails existed as a physical storefront as early as the 1970s but when the internet came those physical storefronts became online storefronts and so the the students today can be subjected to those social media messages in places where i as a professor am not so i told you at the beginning of the presentation you can reach out to me on linkedin on twitter i'm in those spaces a lot i'm on facebook i'm not on TikTok. Um, and I have an Insta account, but I don't use it very often. But this is where our students are. And this is where the contract cheating companies are. Uh, I found um, someone sent me an article today about a pop star who's been promoting uh, a commercial file sharing industry um, or com commercial file sharing company. 
that we consider here to be a contract cheating company uh, and that they're promoting it at, even though the company says that they, uh, yeah, they don't mind if students engage in cheating, that's part of their business. So when we get pop stars starting to engage uh, students in that way, we are facing a whole new level of threat that we didn't, we certainly didn't experience when we were going to school. And I know that our my university is operating from 8.30 to 4.30 every day. And my students are doing their work from 4.30 to 8.30 uh, overnight. And they're going online, they're taking their breaks, they're checking out social media, and they're seeing the ads pop up for, do you need help with your homework? We know that the marketing language of these contract cheating companies is seductive, and it will find students at their most vulnerable. For example, when they're in, at that point of having a time crunch, and they're like, I just can't do it. I'll just engage with this service once. How bad can it be? and little do they know it can be catastrophic for them. So this is one of the reasons I've become a little softer on my stance on deadlines over the years, because I know that if I'm not there for my students, that some other predatory company will be. Um, and although on my campus, I've tried to advocate for things like 24 hour student services uh, and so forth, it hasn't materialized for reasons beyond my control, um, but I do know that the students are out there and, and open to these contract cheating companies at all hours of the day and night. So I say to my students, if you're at the point of making a bad decision, contact me, reach out to me. This is one of the ways that I support uh, student discourse in my classes and I set the climate to support academic integrity throughout the whole course. This all together and combined will create an educational experience for students where they feel engaged in the learning, they want to be there, uh, and they feel engaged with us as their teachers, they're making connections with their, with their fellow students. It can be done, and it has been done for a few decades prior to the pandemic. But what we've experienced during the pandemic is not um, what many of us knew as online learning. So let's take a moment now to turn our attention to uh, factors affecting academic misconduct. And the sources here, I've, I've drawn from various sources and synthesized them into a table here. Over the decades, um, principally uh, folks, folks like Don McCabe and others have talked about individual and contextual factors that will affect academic misconduct. Now, if you work in this uh, sector, the, none of these come as a surprise to you, right? You know that individual factors include a student's maturity level, with younger students typically being more at risk. And we like to use this language of students being at risk or vulnerable rather than using language around culpability and the language matters around this, right? So we know our first year students, first year university and college students will be at more risk than those uh, say in their fourth year or in postgraduate. And I say at large risk, I don't mean uh, immune, uh, but certainly when students are trying to find their way uh, that, that they are more subject to making poor decisions. And we know that stress levels around exam periods, um, then there's more misconduct. This is nothing new. When students are unsure of the expectations, I don't really know what the prof wants. So I will, um, I'll do this. And uh, rather than asking the professor, they're likely to make poor decisions. And student personality, there was a lot of research done around this in the first half of the 20th century by the moral and social psychologists who figured out that sort of there are different personality um, traits that might uh, contribute to cheating with one of them being the high achieving students. I will do anything to get a high grade in my class, uh, including engaging in what we uh, anecdotally call the cheat to compete syndrome. And at the other end of the spectrum, those with low self-confidence who might think, well, I can't say this any better than this other person, so I'm just going to copy what they wrote. Uh, low levels of self-confidence and self-efficacy. Uh, and so those are some of the personality traits that might lead students to make poor decisions and engage in misconduct. And poor self-regulation, self-control, with time management being one of the key things there. Again, none of this is new, but to kind of see it put together in a chart might be helpful. In terms of the contextual factors, our pressure to perform. We'll often see this in international students, for example, if they come from uh, backgrounds where uh, the grades are expected and are seen as a way to, um, you know, garner a parent's love or a caregiver's love, but not only um, international students. So, for example, I'm a first generation university student. Both of my parents left school at age 16 and never went to university. So when I went to university, I was the first person in my family to do so. Uh, and I heard an awful lot about the sacrifices that my parents made so I could go to university. So that pressure to perform is not only our international students, but also uh, domestic students, in particular, first generation students. 
and the competitive learning environment. This is often framed as courses where there is a bell curve for grading. So there are a limited number of, of what we would call A grades. Uh, and then you go up and, you know, most of the grades will be in the, the B and C range. And then at the other end of the bell curve, there's also a limited number of Ds and, and Fs. Um, if there are a limited number of high grades available, students are more likely to compete to get the available high grades. So a competitive learning environment will foster an, a, a, a culture of misconduct, if you will and if instructors are unclear with their expectations. So instructors who refuse to answer questions um, and, or, or take too long to answer student inquiries, asking for clarif clarifying instructions on an assignment, for example, and so forth, and students may just try and do their best and in, in doing so may um, engage in misconduct. We also know that when students think that their friends are cheating, they are more likely to cheat themselves. So when we think about creating sustainable cultures of integrity, we must think about how we will include uh, students in that because students are our best advocates for engaging their peers in conversations uh, and talking to students um, in, in ways that will resonate much more so than I as a professor or um, a researcher ever could. And then instructor attitudes. So we know that when professors care about academic integrity, then students will care more about academic integrity. One of my Canadian colleagues, uh, Julia Christensen Hughes, will, will often say that students cheat when they feel cheated. Uh, so when instructors, for example, continuously insist on recycling their assessments or their tests, students get the idea that profs don't care. And if profs don't care, why should students care? So even simple things like updating our assignments can send a strong message to students that I, I care about you as a student. Uh, and one of the ways I show I care about you is that I update and refresh my uh, assignments and assessments. So these are you know, really simple, easy ways to understand what's uh, happened with regards to academic misconduct over the years. Now, turn my, turn my attention back again to online learning. Talk a little bit about um, academic misconduct during COVID-19. Prior to COVID-19, I mean, folks were researching academic misconduct in online environments. And I can tell you that the research shows uh, that it is uh, results have been inconclusive or contradictory regarding the prevalence of misconduct in online classes versus face-to-face -face con uh, contexts. So the idea that when we move classes online, we are immediately compromising the integrity of our courses isn't actually supported by any of the research. Um, there have been some studies showing that there was more academic uh, misconduct in online environments, often with small sample sizes, for example, or very particular sample sizes at a single institution. Um, but when we look at larger studies, uh, we can see that there have been multiple studies showing less misconduct uh, in online classes versus comparable face-to-face -face uh, classes. So these, these studies here, by Hart and Morgan, Kidwell and Kent, uh, and, and others have shown that they've actually done comparative analysis with the same courses at the same university looking at the online class versus the face-to-face -face class. Um, and there was less misconduct in the online environment. Uh, but I will say that I'll go back to um, thinking about the differences between online uh, education and emergency remote teaching. In every single one of those studies, students chose online learning. So that was the one key factor that was different. And also uh, prior to the pandemic, students who chose online learning were often more mature students, right? Um, and so we know that maturity levels can play uh, a role in, in academic misconduct. So um, the students were often older and they were choosing this. So there was very distinct differences between what they were researching and what's been happening during COVID-19. Um, and then there were uh, other studies that were inconclusive or uh, contradictory in their results or neutral with regards to their results. Uh, so you can see here sort of as you look across the continuum, there is no uh, conclusive evidence to support that the minute we move online, that we all become uh, cheaters and engage in rampant misconduct. It, the evidence just isn't there. But we know that things have changed during COVID-19. So um, as I kind of unpack this research, 
Um, I think it's important to kind of frame how we how we read research, what we look at, uh, and understanding what constitutes quality in research. So we know, for example, uh, randomized controlled trials are always great, and those rarely happen in education um, because of the social nature of education. But we can look at in the influence of researcher bias for those, for example, that uh, engaged in some of the studies saying that there was more misconduct in online learning. As I read some of the previous research by those people, I can note a particular bias against online or distance education in some of their previous work. So that may have come into play. Um, and that we want to understand research that seeks uh, to uh, uh, unpack the debates in the field rather than continue polarizing conversations uh, and understand some of the complexities around this. Um, and then, of course, to re resist the temptation to only read and cite studies that confirm our biases. So, yeah, you can find those studies that say there is more misconduct in online learning, but that's those are not telling the whole story. So when we start to look at the whole picture over time, uh, it becomes a lot less clear. And as I'm talking with, with colleagues about this, of course, to engage in the civil and, and respectful dialogue and debate ar around, um, you know, things like academic cheating, it can be a very polarizing topic. So I'll come into this and present some of the research. And I will be the first to tell you that I have been unable to convince some of my scholar colleagues that although the research has been inconclusive, that there's less cheating in online courses. Um, but I mean, as educators, it is incumbent upon us to look at what the evidence says over time and compare multiple studies. However, we know that things have changed during COVID-19. So let's have a look at that because we know that we're living in a different world now. We know that there have been these rapid changes to online learning and teaching. Um, and that basically our learning communities have been disrupted by the pandemic, right? With constant changes and shifts and all of that happening. Um, we know that there are increases in academic misconduct globally. So if you've been dealing with this at your institution, I can tell you that you're not alone um, and that schools have been reporting upwards of 200, 300, 400 percent increases in academic misconduct during uh, during the pandemic. So you're not alone there. And we we also know that normal online behavior has become regarded as deviant behavior or misconduct. So I'll take a little pause there and unpack that for you because I think this remains a point of contention and debate. So I mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation that you had my permission to take screenshots of my slides, to share them on social media, to give your commentary on Twitter, and I invited you to do that. Why? Because sharing in online environments is normal. We do it all the time. We share status updates, we share photos, we share memes, we share, 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 and this is seen as a good thing. Now, when students go in their online learning classes and they share exam answers, ideas, uh, homework answers, suddenly this is seen as a form of misconduct. So we have taken normal online misconduct of sharing and classified it as deviant because it was deviant in a face-to-face -face setting. So one of the great challenges I think we face with online learning is how to make normal online behavior um, not an act of misconduct. So in other words, how do we teach our students how to share ethically in online spaces? This might mean engaging students in deeper conversations around um, Okay, so talk to me about who you collaborated with. Who did you ask for help with this assignment? How did you get your answers? Uh, and it might be that new ways of collaborating with students is something that we're going to have to grapple with as we know that students doing individual work is just less likely when they're in an on online environment. I would much, much rather have my students tell me that they collaborated with that classmate and they talked it through rather than going, for example, to an online commercial file sharing site or that they got their answers and didn't think it through. If students connected in a, uh, you know, in a real time chat environment with one another saying, I gotta, I'm trying to figure out this problem, can we do it together? Then uh, simply download the, the answer from somewhere. So understanding how students are learning and asking them what their experience is and finding ways to normalize um, online behavior into, into learning behavior and having our students um, share with us their learning process rather than simply wagging our fingers because that was wrong when we were in school and we were only learning face to face. 
Um, and Mr. Kelly talked about this, that uh, the commercial enterprises um, have adapted, the contract cheating companies have adapted during COVID-19, right? I'm sure you've seen the adverts on social media saying, we're offering you a COVID discount. We're here to help you 24 seven. And the antagonizing messages that the contract cheating companies are pitching to our students that they are there for them 24 seven and schools are closed or they're pivoting or they don't care about students. Uh, and so I, we often talk at our school about disrupting those messages. Um, with a, with counter messages of care for our students and engaging an ethic of care as part of our teaching practice uh, and letting our students we are we are there for them uh, we may not have teams of working offshore to answer their chat 24 7 because we also need to sleep um, but and to, I always tell students listen the chat box on a contract cheating site or a homework help site is no substitute for my office hours um, and that 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 they're not connecting with necessarily anybody who cares about them. And this is one of the ways that we're trying to disrupt some of the messaging that's very seductive for our students uh, and, and has been adapting very quickly during COVID-19. So we, we know the contract cheating has been the single biggest threat and increase to uh, our students learning during COVID-19. And I don't know if you've seen the new article by Guy Curtis out of Australia. He was the one that with colleagues in 2017 uh, did a meta-analysis of contract cheating and came up with that sort of number of maybe about 3.5% of students are engaging in contract cheating. Well, um, Guy now with a different group of colleagues and using a different research methodology that doesn't reply on self-reported data, but rather surveying students themselves, has conducted data, uh, data collection during COVID-19 and they have found that uh, that their initial estimate was wrong, and they are now predicting that up to four times more students than they originally predicted have been engaging in contract cheating behaviors, and their data were collected, uh, I think, between September and December 2020. So it's a fascinating read. If you haven't read Guy Curtis's new article, go go have a look at it. Uh, absolutely wonderful to read, but it really, again, sort of says, okay, what do we do now about all of this? Um, because our world has changed. So those individual and contextual factors have now been further complicated by what I'm calling complex factors exacerbated by COVID-19. So those first two columns that you saw, now let's look at that third column. Um, whereas we may have had maturity level or pressure to perform being individual and contextual, now we have multiple and competing priorities, including students who are caring for family members with COVID-19 or they're having to go to work to contribute to the family household income because their parents have lost their job or their parents have become ill. Uh, and so this is a new complexity or, or an exacerbated complexity for so many of our students. Our students, like us, have been living through an extended period of chaos. And those who can deal with chaos well have coped probably a bit better. Uh, but this instability through the learning experience has affected our students and it's affected the rates of misconduct. Uh, and the rapid pivots to new ways of teaching and learning has meant that some educators just haven't been able to be their best self as a teacher during COVID-19. And so students haven't been getting the best learning experience. That's been a a reality during COVID-19. I will say that this uh, needs to all be validated through research, right? But I'm expecting that nothing that I'm telling you is coming as a surprise. And those with a tolerance for ambiguity and living in chaos have been doing better, but it's taking our toll even on the most tolerant. Um, and that multiple modes of learning have added to this complexity, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, or we're back in the classroom or we're not. Uh, and the, these again are sort of new stressors and new changes for our students. So you can suddenly start to see how individual and contextual factors no longer tell the whole story, that we're now looking at complexity um, and factors way outside anybody's control at a societal or mega level that have just never been there before. So all of these things have led to um, increases globally around academic misconduct. So we know that there's these multiple and complex confounding factors uh, around breaches of integrity and ethics. Um, we know that there is a need to disrupt the myth that there is a cause and effect relationship. Simply going online doesn't make people um, suddenly turn into cheaters. Um, we want to continue to disrupt that message and that we know that efforts required to develop those trusting relationships with our students online and let them know that we do care about them. Uh, and, and of course, creating those 
excellent online uh, learning um, experiences for our students, right? We want them to come in. We want them to learn and be challenged and have a good time and be inspired to continue with all this work. And all of that takes effort as we all continue to live through the global pandemic. So I think uh, one of the really exciting things that you're doing in Ireland right now with your National uh, Academic Integrity Network, I mean, you have a National Academic Integrity Network. Oh, my goodness. You have suddenly catapulted yourselves into leaders on a global way that no other country has, in my opinion, um, with you being a peer driven network of academic and professional staff, student representatives and representative agencies from across the higher education landscape. When I read that, I tell you, I was so inspired. I really think the work you're doing in Ireland is absolutely cutting edge uh, and that the rest of us around the globe really need to pay attention to what you're doing in Ireland, because quite frankly, from what I had from a sneak peek of those documents prior to today's presentation, you've got it right um, and the rest of the world will be looking to you because we also know that the academic integrity community as mr kelly said it is global you have peers around the world i know you have you've been working with your peers in europe and beyond we know that it's transdisciplinary it's no longer about plagiarism being the work of english professors this is affecting everybody in every discipline uh, and looking at this uh it, it's no longer enough that i only work um you know, with others who have a humanities or social sciences background. I'm also doing work with folks in computer science, in physics, in, in biochemistry, and these are new disciplines for me. And I can tell you, it makes me feel a little unsure of myself when I work with those folks, but I also know it's, it's absolutely necessary. I can't stay in my disciplinary silo, and I encourage you to do the same. We also know that this is boundary spanning work. Individual teachers can no longer work on their own to do this kind of work. We need the support of our administrators, our schools, our systems, our networks, uh, and that we must come together as nonprofit organizations, corporate, government, educators. All of us need to work together. This is the nature of transdisciplinary work that we're working with people in multiple sectors. And if you hear a little bit of extra noise in the background, that's just that's just the cat on the scratching post. It's one of the things we do working from home. So we know this work as well as transdisciplinary it, uh, Transdisciplinary problems are complex problems that no individual can address by themselves. We need a concerted effort of people working across sectors, working together, working across disciplines. We need the scientists, the scholars, the educators, the policymakers, all working together in that cross fertilization of knowledge, um, which I think your, your network is going to be doing in Ireland that no other network that I can tell around the world is going to be doing. We want to transgress um, old models of uh, traditional modes of scientific and scholarly inquiry and understand, okay, what do we need to be doing now? We we're living in a complex world that uh, has new challenges that we've never seen before, and it's up to us to respond to them. This is an uncomfortable way of working um, for a scholar who's trained uh, as an individual scholar to, or even a team scholar to work in one's own discipline to go um, beyond that is uncomfortable and it's also exciting. Um, and that to do this work, uh, humility and tolerance are key. So when I was talking about this with colleagues from the European network, I said, you know, I'm doing a project now with colleagues who say, oh, I need to I need to move my meeting because I've just been called into a committee meeting. And the committee was the Canadian Space Agency because they were doing some work with them. I'm like, wow, OK, that's so out of my realm as somebody with an education and uh, and languages background. Um, that was new for me, but of course we we made uh, we made the um, uh, accommodations that we needed to make. So it's it's wildly exciting and also uncomfortable, and that's part of the joy of it. So I'll kind of circle back to this idea of academic integrity as a shared responsibility, keeping the students at the heart of what I, our work, and also letting our students know that they are not alone that we are here for them in many and multiple ways, and we are here to support them. And I'll take a little moment to just dwell for a moment on the role of academic leadership. Um, you know, years ago, Don McCabe would say it was essential for academic leadership to set the tone uh, for academic integrity at an institution and to set the culture and to talk uh, about aspirational and inspirational messages. And I agree with McCabe. And at the same time, I also disagree with him by saying it is essential and simultaneously not enough for higher education leaders to only speak in inspirational or aspirational terms. We also need concrete resources to support this work on our campuses. So we, the school cultures of integrity cannot develop without leadership to support the work. And that support has to come in the form of concrete resources. Um, 
So that means the allocation of resources at the local level, the school level, including personnel, academic integrity offices, for example, at every school, on every campus. And the, this cannot be allocated to one person to bear the burden of this work at an institution. This requires a team effort with multiple people being trained on campuses to do the work, to engage in collaborative learning, professional development, and so on. We also need to uh, have multiple people working on policy updates and how to enact those policies, ensure they have teeth, uh, but also to provide teaching and learning support so that academic integrity is not thought of only as uh, addressing a breach uh, or that policy is, is only to come into effect when there's uh, a misconduct, but also thinking about how do we create proactive cultures of integrity on our campuses? And this will take the word, this is where the offices of teaching and learning come in, uh, because often that will be done through instructional activities, but not only through instructional activities, through also through student affairs, libraries, uh, and other units on our campuses and in our schools so that we are creating these cultures of integrity uh, that are supported through resources. So a key message here is if you're a higher education leader, please think about supporting this work with concrete resources, money and people to do the work uh, on an ongoing basis, not funded from project funding, but from operational budgets that can be sustained over time because we know that these challenges are not going away. We can forecast that even though contract cheating uh, has surfaced uh, and amplified during COVID-19, that is not the only threat to integrity that we're going to face. We know that online learning is, is here to stay, but we also know that the influence of blockchain, for example, being used to buy contract cheating services is a reality. We know that machine learning, artificial intelligence, algorithmic writing technologies, the technology is already here that can write for people in general, not only students, um, but that, the, that there will be increasing services that will simply uh, provide a machine written thesis paper for our students. We need to be aware of the technology threats that we are facing with this work. We need to think beyond student conduct, these multi-stakeholder approaches where everybody on our campus has different responsibilities, complementary responsibilities, but that we are all responsible for upholding and enacting academic integrity within our schools. Um, and that we know that uh, there will be more global collaborations and transdisciplinary research in academic integrity. There are new articles and research coming out every week. Um, and uh, I think the, the quality of that research is also increasing over time. So another call to um, funding uh, funders, if you're here, is to fund academic integrity research, particularly into contract cheating, so that researchers can work in teams across your country to gather data that you're not having to rely on data from other countries to understand what's happening in your own country. So I'll conclude here. I know we've just got a few minutes left with calls to action. Honestly, I mean, I know this is why we're here today, but to celebrate um, the work that you're doing in Nain and in Ireland broadly uh, as national and global leaders of academic integrity, the work, the documents are truly inspiring. I hope you enjoy the launch this morning uh, and that you challenge outdated notions such as uh, online environments are responsible in and of themselves or that there is a cause and effect relationship. It's up to you as champions of integrity to disrupt those old notions. Also that academic integrity is merely a matter of student conduct. We know it's not. We know that you're here to be champions of this work uh, and then also to be attentive to uh, the, and be proactive with regards to the emerging threats to academic integrity, particularly in the form of new technologies and more sophisticated ways of file sharing companies and contract cheating companies to infiltrate um, and uh, yeah, really disrupt in a bad way our educational systems as they exist. So I'll conclude there. Thank you again for inviting me to join you today. And uh, I'm really excited to hear more about the launch of your meeting. Thank you, Dr. Eaton. Um, I think that was a, a really thought provoking presentation that certainly challenges us all to question more, do more and uh, work together more, I think, to build a more sustainable culture of academic integrity. And I think one of the great successes of the National Academic Integrity Network to date has been the breadth of stakeholders. And, you, and you've spoken to that, who have really actively engaged in the network. And I think it's wonderful to see the range of participants at today's event, which I think echoes that transdisciplinary and stakeholder uh, multi-stakeholder approach that you've advocated. 
Um, so in that spirit, I hope you don't mind if, if we look at some of the questions that today's attendees have posed. And uh, there's there's a, a few that I think are, are very, very interesting. So I'm going to start with one from Oshin Hassan. Uh, and Oshin is the programme manager at the National Student Engagement Programme. So it will give you, I suppose, a sense of where, where the perspective is coming from here. And Oshin has asked, um, thinking about the idea of students at the centre and creating a dialogue that you've raised, I wonder, have you any thoughts on how institutions can meaningfully partner or collaborate with students through academic integrity work? I love this question. Thank you so much for this. Um, yes, myriad of ways. Uh, so we, I mean, I'll give you some examples from, from our university, which is certainly not the be all and end all, but um, they're, they're local examples and relevant to me. So we have engaged students, for example, in policy development. We've always got student reps on our policy committees. Um, but beyond that, engaging our, we do often do it through our student governments or through our students' union. So for example, with the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating coming up on October 20th, we have a, a planning committee. We've made sure that we have student reps on that committee. We've said, what do you need to support you with your activities, uh, whether it's prizes or we, we just let them go. They plan their own fabulous activities, their own social media campaigns. We give them the support. Um, we also educate them about some of the threats. We find students are often unaware of the blackmail and extortion that can happen from the contract cheating companies. But we, we really want our students to be at the forefront because we know that they have way more sway with other students than, than we do. So engaging students in the proactive piece as well, the activities, uh, as well as the policy discussions. Does that help? I think it really does and, and I think it's certainly reflective of our experience at Nain as well because we, we have had the most incredible student members both in the network and in our working groups and really they have shaped our work so much so uh, great great to hear, hear that uh, extra insight from yourself as well. Uh, keeping with the student theme I, I noticed a, a, a question posed by the NCISU president so I assume it's Diana so I hope it, I, I haven't got that wrong and Diana's uh, question is hi Sarah great presentation just wondering what you see as the greatest risk risks to institutions and students in the context of academic misconduct? Okay, this is another terrific question. Um, yeah, I think for us having blinders on, right? Um, so for those of us that know about contract cheating, for example, um, that uh, you know that we, we know about the predatory nature of some of these companies, but keeping blinders on about that, I think will be our biggest detriment and also not understanding the ways in which these companies are rapidly developing, right? So it, we talked about essay mills, but we know from Thomas Lancaster's definition of contract cheating, it goes beyond that. It affects all disciplines. Um, and I think one of the big threats as well is to graduate education. We didn't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but the uh, thesis consulting services, in other words, the essay mills for theses and graduate students as graduate education becomes more important. Um, and then other threats, of course, will be non-commercial things, even um, like machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence and our algorithmic writing. So there's a lot on the horizon. And if you're in this sector doing this work, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. And just to clarify, it wasn't Diana. I've been put right. It was Connor O'Reilly, who is the newly elected president of NCI. So very important to get that right. Thanks, Connor. Great question. Uh, a question from Ross Anderson from the University of Limerick. Um, Ross has asked, what do you see as the key roles for senior management in HEIs in promoting and embedding academic integrity? Uh, great question. So in addition to resource allocation, uh, I would say as well, I mean, supporting academic staff, right? Uh, and letting them know that in terms of uh, there are supports to supports to help them with their teaching and learning. But if they want to report misconduct, that their employment isn't going to be threatened, or their um, semester evaluations are not going to be, um, you know, threatened. Or we know sometimes it has happened that students might retaliate through their end of course evaluations for professors who've reported them for misconduct. Uh, but then helping uh, an instructor frame uh, any negative comments in the student evaluations of teaching uh, to be able to say, okay, well, you know, if you've reported misconduct, your scores might go down. And that doesn't mean that you're a bad teacher or that you might be subjected to, um, you know, lower pay or having your employment in jeopardy. And also maybe creating institutional cultures around these student evaluations of teaching um, so that they are um, less of a threat for instructors as well. So that I think is an important piece that we haven't talked about. And I, I think interestingly, Ross, Ross had a follow up question to that, which I think is again interesting in terms of and I don't I don't know if there are any examples, but can you think of any examples of institutions who are really leading the way in this area at all and um, that we could look to uh, for student evaluations of teaching? 
Uh, no, particularly in terms of supporting, uh, I suppose, uh, academic staff uh, in, 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 uh, with, with dealing with academic integrity. Yeah, I think we're looking to the teaching and learning centres. Um, and I know we've been doing some work around that in Canada. Uh, some Australians, Edith Cowan University has uh, some supports as well. Deakin University in Australia um, looking to support uh, academic staff, but particularly through the teaching and learning centres um, at the various campuses. Super, thank you so much. Um, a question from Rita Collins, one of my colleagues at Hibernia College. So R Rita has asked, Supporting for stu support for students undertaking academic writing needs to be built into a programme. What supports would you recommend? Oh, wow. OK, I love this um, because uh, the idea is that it's ongoing, ongoing supports for students. So we, we talk here about the need for um, maybe an introductory tutorial for students around academic integrity that they have as part of their orientation or pre-arrival activities. But then that's supported through ongoing workshops and writing support for the students. We we know, I mean, even as an academic, I know my writing has continued to develop and so have my citing and referencing skills and a one off workshop just won't do it, um, that we need to have continuous support for students throughout their schooling. Thank you. I, th I think that's a that's a really important message. And um, I suppose looking at student supports again, there's a question here from Vanessa Murphy. She's asked about, can you comment on the potential blurring lines between caring for students and responsibility for their well-being? And I think that is a challenge that I suppose goes beyond academic integrity, but probably, you know, also sits within it. Any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, and I've experienced th this myself. There have been points with my own students. I thought, OK, um, yeah, I, wa I want to be uh, caring and I want to engage in ethic of care. And yet I'm not a counsellor and I need to be able to know when I need to refer students to student wellness um, for an appointment with a counsellor because that I have limitations. So I'm not a qualified psychologist or a therapist. And I need to be able to know where that line is with the student and also to not get so personally involved with them um, when they're having things that are just beyond beyond me to help with. Um, and so I think this is one of the coaching things that um, actually our administrators can help us with is saying to uh, teaching us when is when is the point when we need to refer students on because there that does happen quite often. And I feel for you because I've been there. Thank you. Now, I suppose the, the question that I suppose is, is always the, the, the hairy question in the room to a certain extent, which is the question of proctoring. So Sharon Flynn has asked about remote proctoring and, and, and it has been much discussed over the past 18 months. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, well, there's probably not <laughs> enough time. Um, uh, uh, OK, well, I'll just I'll declare my bias right up. I said that was part of my positionality as a qualitative researcher. I'm not a fan of remote proctoring. Um, we did set up a task force, I think, like so many other universities uh, here, maybe about a year ago, a little bit more, because our provost at the time was was hell bent that we were going to have a proctoring um, company in place for the new academic year last year. And I was on the task force that was um, set up for that. I started looking into the research and was ultimately unconvinced about the efficacy of these programs to, um, uh, you know, uh, lower the academic misconduct so that there might be a deterrent. But we were looking at like a quarter million dollar contract and the prices were going up, it seemed, every day as these companies, right, were pitching their products to us. Um, and I also know that that needs to be balanced because we have students here in professional programs such as nursing or accounting and they're going to go on and take licensure exams in their professions where they will be subjected to online exams that use proctoring. So in some fields it may be justified particularly in order to prepare students for professional licensure exams. But I will say, I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's a silver bullet. I do think that there are risks to students. There's almost no research to understand to what extent these services exacerbate um, uh, test anxiety. And I said, one of the things I said to our senior administration was, right, what supports are we gonna have in place for a mental health emergency that appears uh, happens on camera while a student is being remote proctored. And it's uh, either an artificial intelligence that's proctoring them or it's an individual offshore. What supports are we gonna have for the students um, who are engaging in self-harming behaviors during their exams? And the answer was, we had none uh, and we couldn't put them into place. Uh, and so that for us became a determining factor why we didn't get proctoring. Um, and we also know that the, these programs um, have algorithmic biases against persons of color. 
And so students of darker skin tones um, are discriminated against by the technology. So there were, again, sort of multiple factors. Our university didn't, didn't pay the big bucks. We didn't pay the quarter of a million dollars for the year-long license for that. We've instead put money into teaching and learning resources, but we've also made exceptions. So, yeah, this is a big hornet's nest. That's my concluding thought on that. Yeah, and I think that's that's a, that's a really interesting perspective. And I, I think that the fact is, as, as you said, that there isn't a silver bullet here and there's no clear yes, no answer. I think it's it's a much more complex topic than than uh, maybe we can cover. Um, I'm going to give you one last question because you've done so well. You've taken so many so quickly and, and thank you for that. Uh, one from Sue Ming-Ku. She's, she's asked about uh, values and principles and she says there's a big emphasis on avoiding vices and misconduct, but less conversation about integrity as doing good work and promoting working in a good way. Any further thoughts on this? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, we know that these values of academic integrity have been, um, they were originally proposed by Don McKay, became the foundation of the Academic International Centre for Academic Integrity. Um, and I, I also look at some of these values, right? I, I know them, you know them as well, right? Courage, fairness, honesty, respect, responsibility and trust. But the values are not obs um, absolute. So one of the things I'll sometimes dwell on is, a, is the value of responsibility. So it's often framed as students doing their own work and students doing honest work. For some students in social context, they also have a responsibility to help their peers. Um, and so when I say this, sometimes people are all, automatically go to international students and collectivist cultures and I can say, we have examples here in North America of students working, uh, they call them frat files, fraternity files or sorority files, and that's not meant to disparage anybody who has an experience working with the Greek society, because I know Greek societies, fraternity sororities do good work as well. But in many of them, they've had file boxes in the basement for decades of old exams and old assignments that students could go and access, not only access, but also had a responsibility to contribute to. Over the years, those file boxes have turned into Google folders and Google drives. But this notion of students needing to contribute to um, shared folders in order to maintain their social standing in a group is a responsibility to that group. So these values are not absolute. Um, and the ways in which they're enacted, I think, need to be contextualized for students. And setting up the academic integrity as this ethical decision making for life, I think, can be a valuable conversation to have with them over time. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Eaton. I suppose a couple of things just to, to, to add. The, 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 the chat box is utterly full of comments in terms of thanking you for your, your, your inspiring and very thought provoking talk, but also really delighted with the answers to the questions that you, you, you've given today. So we really appreciate both your presentation, your, your, your very perceptive responses to all of those questions. And most of all, for getting up in the middle of the night <laughs> with your lovely cat. Cat. And I have a cat office mate too, so I appreciate that completely uh, to speak with us this morning in Ireland. Um, I know all of the participants have found your answers and 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 your presentation most insightful, and we'll be delighted to hear that. Uh, thanks to your 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 good grace, we'll post the Q and A on the Nain website uh, shortly as well. So yeah. uh, thank Thanks you so once much. again, Dr. Eaton. We we really really appreciate it. I hope you get to look at those lovely questions and comments in the chat box. And I'm I will. I'll hang out, have a look at them. Brilliant. And I'm going to pass back now to our chair, Billy Kelly. Thank you, everybody.